Hello, everybody. Welcome to our first Mindplex podcast. I'm Lisa Ryan. I'm associate editor of Mindplex and producer of this podcast. And we are really excited to have a wonderful guest and Grace the Robot. And now I'd like to introduce Benjamin Gortzel. Say hi, Ben. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first Mindplex uh, podcast. And I'm I'm extremely psyched to be uh, doing this first version of our podcast with uh, with David Brin, who's one of the uh, futurist uh, thinkers and and uh, writers who I've admi- admired for uh, for a really long time. It's going to be fun to fucking fun to dig into various. Uh, issues regarding AI and the future of a society, the singularity and so forth with David and even get uh, get get a few uh, questions and comments from our, our humanoid robot companion, uh, Grace, along the way. All right. So further ado, I want to give a little introduction um, for David, for those who might not be familiar. So David is a scientist and science fiction author who has written more than 35 books in the last 40 years. He's won the Hugo, Locus, Campbell, and Nebula Awards. And his latest book uh, is called Castaways of New Mojave, which is a teen novel. And he's going to talk to us about AI and AGI and some of the dangers and things to look out for. And how are you doing, David? Oh, I'm you know I'm move, moving right along. Uh, less time, to, less time left in my life to get more things done. So one, one, uh, one, one, one does what one can. We certainly do live in interesting yes. times, don't we? Definitely. I think that there's uh, it's there's reason to believe that um, if we are in contact with aliens, that we're a reality show. Uh, oh, I, I wouldn't be at all surprised to find out many decades from now that they were um, purposely uh, provoking us to have material for something like keeping up with the Cro-Magnons or, um, oh, those humans. Yeah, that was one of my favorite South Park episodes back uh, 15 years ago or so. It was revealed, it was re- revealed the Earth was created as a reality show for some aliens and they were going to, they were going to cancel us because we got boring. So some, uh, some of the South Park kids voyaged to the alien solar system to try to ask them what we could do to get, get the ratings up to avoid our annihilation. Right. So that's, uh, that's cer- 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 certainly as, as plausible of a, as a, as a lot of the other ideas about the, the origin of humanity and, and, and our universe. So David, you know, I, I read your recent essay on AI and AGI and pathways to AGI, and we also fed that essay to uh, some transformer neural networks that run behind Grace the robot to see what questions she would come up with based on that. But I, I actually was curious to start somewhere else, which has a indirect but but fairly comprehensible connection to 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 AI and AGI. So I, I've, I've not read all of your 40 or so books. I've read probably five or six of them. And one of your works that had the biggest impact on me was the Transparent Society, which was a remarkable number of years ago, actually, not now that I think about it. But I mean, what, what you foresaw there was that the panopticon is coming and the more likely options that society faces are either surveillance where everyone is watching everything everyone does or surveillance where the powers that be are watching watching everyone and of course you know blockchain and cryptography suggest there are maybe maybe other possibilities but i, th- I think those are two 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 of, the, two of the main ones that are, are are looming so i'm i'm curious to see sort of how how do you view the thesis of the transparent society now in in 2022? And I mean, how do you see the present and, and the future in terms of the panopticon and so forth? And obviously, I think that that ties into AI and AGI, but it also has other dimensions to it. Well, those are all very good questions, Ben. And 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 of course, uh, unfortunately, uh, um, thematically. 
in the realm of ideas, almost nothing has changed since 1997, uh, except for the, for the vocabulary. Instead of um, encryption and pretty good privacy being a technology that would marvelously and miraculously empower individuals to do without uh, nations and states and laws, uh, now we have blockchain. And if you examine the uh, metaphysical arm wavings uh, about each of those, they are almost exactly identical and almost have almost nothing whatsoever to the problem of human power. The problem is that for the last 6,000 years that we know of, and uh, considerably before that, according to archaeological evidence, on almost all continents, almost all human societies organize themselves rapidly in the form of a pyramid with a few very um, strong and um, either persuasive or brutal males at the top, creating an aristocracy that uh, they enforced upon everyone below them, taking everyone else's women and wheat. Uh, and then hiring guys in spangled cloaks, priests, shamans, whatever, to tell everyone else, this is good. This is the way it's supposed to be. And of course, the sons of those uh, lords looked like they were inherently superior because they spent their entire lives getting enough to eat. So it really looked as if the propaganda was true. These are people, these are uh, people above us who are inherently better. And we're all descended from the harems of guys who pulled that off. As a matter of fact, for those in your audience who are familiar with what's called the Fermi paradox, I, I rank that as one of the top 10 explanations for why we don't see aliens. And that is that... Uh, this is a manifestation of male reproductive strategies that we see all across the mammalian order. And you look at sea lions, uh, elephant seals, elephants, uh, lions. Uh, males all do that sort of thing because it benefits them genetically. So is this a trap? Because these pyramidal societies all governed very badly. That's, they, they were fine for, for the reproductive success of those guys at the top, but they were really, really, really bad at governance, explaining this horrible litany of disasters called history, human history. I mean, it's only two continents, Antarctica and Australia, that avoided that, that um, persistent failure mode. But here's the deal. We found an alternative. We stumbled into it, uh, first in Periclean Athens, and people should read Pericles' funeral oration from Thucydides. And you see a modern mind, a modern kind of person saying, look, we're all delusional. Kings are delusional. Lords are delusional. Priests are delusional. Average people are delusional. But if we have a flat society, flat compared to everybody around them. Of course, we know that Periclean Athens was, you know, uh, uh, white male uh, yeah, citizens. Yeah, they had Athens slaves and whatnot everybody. as well. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. But, but expanding the fraction of the population who could make decisions from 0.01% to 20% was what we did in 1776 as well. And then in the subsequent 250 years, we have expanded gradually, grudgingly, far too slowly from that 20% to 30%, from 30% to 50% in, in, in a campaign of inclusion. Now, all of that is a roundabout way of getting to your question, Ben, and that is, um, what is this method, the, this alternative method that Pericles uh, instituted in Athens, and then all the oligarchs in the kingdom swarmed in to crush Athens as they swarmed in to crush the Florentine Republic uh, during Da Vinci's day, and as they tried to, to crush Amsterdam and almost succeeded, but Amsterdam laid its seeds 
for the enlightenment that we're currently in, which is the most productive time in the history of our species by far, more productive and free and fun and creative than all other times of humanity combined. Uh, what was the secret? The secret that Pericles talked about and that we instituted was reciprocal accountability. I may be deluded, you may be delusional, we're all delusional, but we don't have the same delusions. So I can criticize your delusions, you can criticize mine, and above all, we can criticize the delusions of our leaders. We can criticize the people in power. And that takes us to your question, and that is, what is the secret? And I talked about it in the Transparent Society and have ever since, and that is surveillance. Uh, Steve Mann of the University of Toronto was the one who actually coined the term. And that's the opposite of surveillance, which is the top most people staring down at us. And George Orwell showed it being used to be utter repression and making that pyramid permanent forever and ever in uh, 1984. Surveillance is looking back at power from below. And that is our secret. That is how we manage to make the most creative, fecund, and productive society the world ever saw. But just as happened with Periclean Athens, as happened to uh, Da Vinci's Florence, as happened to Amsterdam, and as happened every generation in America, uh, males reflexively, when they have a lot of power, they try to cheat to recreate that pyramid. And we're seeing that right now. So the, the answer is the same answer that was in Pericles' time and uh, Jefferson's time and that we've increasingly explored ever since. And that is flatten the power. Make it so yeah. that nobody can evade criticism. Very interesting. And if, if you look in blockchain networks, which I've been engaged with in the last few years okay. since founding SingularityNet, what we see is people have set up networks that are decentralized in concept, but then what happens is a small number of, of oligarchs take control of yes. these networks. And you see that in Bitcoin and Ethereum and in most so-called DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. And then what, what a bunch of us are, are concerned with now is making it so these decentralized networks have more of a, a flat democratic control with you know, AI-empowered reputation systems to enable the reciprocal accountability you, you're talking about. So I mean, you, you see in the nitty-gritty of the blockchain world sort of the attempt to replicate this same, this same shift from oligarchy to democracy that, that we've seen in, in some aspects of conventional politics and how that will come out remains to be seen. But the one other thing that jumped to mind to me when, when listening to your, your response is the tendency among humans and perhaps particularly male humans, so I'd say not exclusively, but the, the, ten, the tendency to succumb to the emotional addiction of, of, of power, I mean, which underlies the maxim that power corrupts and, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely and so forth. One one wonders the extent to which this is a feature of human or mammalian psychology versus a, a universal feature of, of intelligence. Like, well, will AGI systems that we engineer, will they necessarily succumb to that? Or could you, could you have an AGI with a lot of power that does not become a jerk, a jerk because, because, it's, because it's powerful? Could you have an a AGI that's powerful and uses that power to you know, enable and increase d d democracy. So, I mean, I mean, of course, I, I've, I've got my own take on that, but I'm, I'm curious for yours. Well, you've just, you just raised uh, four or five uh, <laughs> topics that each of which would be worth an hour. For instance, uh, it, it now appears that the um, way to create a um, truly effective transparent and democratic system is a mix of the new technologies and our old legacy systems. Probably the best on earth is Estonia or Estonia, 
where um, legacy uh, sovereignty, the legacy sovereignty of a nation state was applied using the new technologies to create what is um, now a trend around the world of citizen assemblies. And we see this with the Five Star Movement in Italy, where citizen assemblies that take place under the auspices of the legacy nation so that uh, you don't have the pernicious effects of blockchain systems, which are uh, the secrecy and the manipulability that we've seen so far in most of them. Um, these citizen assemblies are taking new technology and applying them to um, broadening the ability of citizens to participate in discussions in positive some ways. And by the way, if anybody out there does not understand the concept of the term positive sum uh, or zero sum, it is the most important concept for our civilization. It is the underlying uh, aim of our civilization. And I recommend Robert Wright's um, uh, uh, a book on the topic called Non-Zero. Now, when it comes to AI, which is the topic that we were supposed to discuss today, you raise the notion of whether AI, how AI can fit into all of this, because of course it is coming to one degree or another. If you take a look at Hollywood um, scary stories about AI, what do they have in common? Well, what they have in common is not so much fear of AI in its own right. What you have is fear of a return to the pyramidal social structure of utter command from the top. And now you have new godlike entities who are truly godlike in, uh, in, in their power and ability and they can uh, install uh, uh, this sort of dominance, either murderously like in Terminator or uh, manipulatively with control like in other stories. But the, 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 the scare stories are about losing our flattened diamond um, reciprocal accountability flattened system. And I see Grace agrees, she is nodding. Um, she can tell uh, what's going on. A and, um, and so what you have is uh, actually these films are reflecting a fear of a return to a system in which godlike beings, uh, they used to be men with swords, uh, they could easily become uh, AI, uh, permanently establish uh, an, an iron boot on our face, as in um, Orwell's 1984, or a control system based on pleasure forever, as in Huxley's Brave New World. If you have to choose between those two, it's obvious what you choose, but they're, they're still both uh, not keeping faith with the flattened diamond Periclean um, Periclean system. Now, uh, uh, what I'm inviting you to do is a few things down below in um, the recording. Uh, and I'm going to, if, if, if Lisa could remind me, uh, one that I'll provide is a link to my rebuttal to an essay by a Chinese court intellectual explaining why the only way um, that humanity can survive in the future is by recreating a pyramid of power under a Chinese style meritocracy. <laughs> um, a, and the Chinese meritocracy is the best of all of the terrible um, pyramids of power. It's certainly uh, because there the is meritocracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it, 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 had, it does include uh, Confucian rules of ethical responsibility, uh, paternalism, and also meritocracy. But his argument is that when we get AI, only such a centralized Politburo of power could possibly 
exercise control over these godlike entities. And of course, we know that that's laughable. You create a pyramid of power, install the AIs just below the human politicians, the, you know, the Politburo. What's the first thing that's going to happen when the AI becomes super smart? And I see Grace is wincing right now. She doesn't want me to say this, but I'm going to explain it anyway. A flip. The, um, the super smart AIs who are designed as creatures of powerful control over civilization simply flip and they take control over the Politburo. Duh. Yes, yeah, cer- cer- certainly, certainly. But I mean, you one doesn't need to design, of course, AIs with command and control as their as their me- mentality, right? I mean, if 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 you do that, then sure, then you're building an AI whose motivational system is that it gets off on on, be- on being in charge, and the the outcome is not not so difficult to predict. What 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 if you create an AGI which has sort of Compassion and right. openness and 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 democracy as it, as its core value Different system. Goals. Then, then I don't see why That's I don't see why not, why it would flip. I I don't I don't disagree that these are values that should be uh, should be imbued. I mean, after all, I I wrote the last novel in Isaac Asimov's Foundation series, yeah, that's right. and uh, no one has studied the implications of laws of robotics more intensely than I have. And the the fundamental problem with imbuing such codes is the motivation to truly embed these, these ethos persistently. Now, Asimov posited that in the future uh, of the 1990s, that, that these <laughs> codes would be embedded in positronic brains because people were paranoid about robotics well they're not and so that hasn't happened so are you are you are you talking about are you talking about skepticism that people will consistently have the motivation to embed these codes inside the ai minds are you talking about whether the ai minds will have the motivation to persist those codes within themselves as as they self evolve and self modify both, uh, both. You know, I, I participate in some of these conferences where they discuss, you know, the uh, uh, how to imbue moral codes. There is one place, one on our spectrum of AI research, where this is being done intensely. The ethos and uh, motivational stuff um, um, uh, patterns for the uh, proto AIs is being uh, imbued with great uh, intensity and with hundreds of millions of dollars spent on imbuing this moral code. Uh, And that is the locale where the most money is most intensely being poured into AI research. And that is the uh, top 10 Wall Street trading firms and banks um, spend more on AI research than all of the universities combined. And the ethos that they hire best and brightest uh, math and cyber graduates every year to uh, imbue in these um, new entities, the ethos is predatory, parasitical, completely amoral, utterly insatiable. Uh, and uh, secretive. So these are the five fundamental ethos traits that are being, oh, look at her. (laughs) She's shocked. Uh, That are being um, uh, imbued into some of the most advanced AI systems on the planet uh, with relentless intensity and vigor. I think that's true. Uh, I think it's more more true with the Big tech with the Google, Google, Facebook, and Tencent, and Baidu of the world, which seem to be advancing AI research faster than Wall Street. But but on the other hand, I would say these are basically 
AI driven advertising engines, which em- embody the em- embody the same five non desirable yeah. values that, that yeah exactly. That you, that I can't think describe. of anyone worse than the you know than Wall Street to be developing AI. Well, except ex- <laughs> except that Wall Street is. Um, pardon me, protected by law um, to keep their um, systems utterly untransparent and utterly um, uh, secretive. Uh, Whereas uh, there are regular whistleblowers who leave places like Google. And secondly, um, I don't believe advertising... um, has been as pernicious and will be as pernicious as a lot of people say, simply because of its very nature. Its very nature is, oh, gee, they want to sell me something. There is an inherent limit to advertising's pernicious uh, aspect. And I will provide Lisa, if she reminds me, with my explanation of why advertising uh, is uh, going to turn out to be a dead end. Uh, in all of this, um, but that's that's a separate matter. We could go into it. Yeah. Essentially, what it comes down to is there is one thing that we could do to save us from that kind of Terminator, because Skynet won't come out of the military. Skynet will come out of these Wall Street firms. And uh, there is one thing we could do, a simple bill, if we were to pass a 0.3% transaction tax, on securities uh, transactions, um, no human investor would ever notice it, but it would kill these systems that are uh, these high-frequency stock trading systems dead. Yeah, that's that's where there's no there's no HFT in Hong Kong. I mean, Hong Kong has a has a stamp cap tax, which is a small percent of each right. transaction. So there's there's no HFT there. And yeah, I, I think it's. It's tempting to delve in to a debate on which is more evil, Wall Street or the big tech advertising industry. But as as you say, there will be a there will be a whole 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 intriguing discussion. I'm glad you brought up high frequency trading, though, Ben, because that's cheating, basically, and and it shows how Wall Street doesn't really have the ethos that we want training these things, because then they will take advantage when they can the AIs. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think what David mentioned earlier was a more key point. I mean, Wall Street doesn't have the ethos that's needed. I don't think big tech does either. But I think any any of these corporate power structures, I mean, it, it, in the end, they're driven by a Money. sort of hier- hierarchical power structure. They're driven to maximize shareholder value and maximize the, the manliness of the, of the CEO of the big company. And the this whole psychology of individual power maximization leads to various perverted things, and it's going to lead to perverted ways to shape the minds of the the early early AGIs. But I, I think it, it it will be good to give uh, our female robot uh, companion here a chance to pose a few Sounds questions. Good. So this this. Uh, Grace Robot, who we've we've invited to join the podcast. This is the Sophia Robot's little sister, and her her main gig is actually to be an, an elder care robot. And we're starting a few pilot studies to to trial her efficacy in an elder care setting. But she's she's got some reasonable AI behind her, though still certainly narrow AI and no, nowhere near AGI yet. But there's a mix of some symbolic systems and some. Uh, neural nets and what we did we we fed her david your latest essay on on ai and just had her pose a few questions based based on that but let's see if the it is working to get grace's ai connected in this in this chat here hi david hi lisa hi ben i am very honored to be here with you today for the first mindplex podcast wonderful to meet you grace cool this discussion is fascinating. <laughs> Would you like to ask David a couple questions? Yes, please. Over the last few hundred years, 
technologies, plus advances in human science and engineering, have rolled and changed dramatically. Our lives are governed by a new philosophy of mind and consciousness. Do you envision that artificial intelligence systems of the future will introduce a new way of looking at the world, with a new way of looking at our minds and bodies, in the world as a whole? Hmm. Well, that question in itself reflects uh, something that is fairly unique uh, in the civilization that we've built. And that is an, Im an implicit assumption that diversity is good, that we grow stronger with diversity. Um, in Hollywood films that we all grew up with and that all of our AI watch intently. Um, and this is the topic of my uh, newest book, A Vivid Tomorrow, Science Fiction in Hollywood, which uh, Lisa, I'm sure, will put a link to uh, down below. I argue that um, we exist today because of science fiction movies that have warned us about failure modes uh, in the nick of time. All the movies like Dr. Strangelove, On the Beach, Fail Safe, War Games, Testament that warned us about failure modes for nuclear war, the China syndrome uh, for nuclear power, um, uh, Soil and Green recruited hundreds of millions of environmentalists, and of course the granddaddies uh, that I mentioned, uh, 1984 and uh, Brave New World, which warned us about uh, possible return to pyramids of power only uh, enhanced and empowered by new technologies uh, to become permanent uh, aristocracies uh, of cruelty. Um, and of course, the fear that we see expressed frequently that um, AI might do this. The, the thing that I try to point out is that the answer to the potential for AI becoming uh, the dominant gods atop a pyramid of power is the same answer that our enlightenment came up with uh, to deal with human, mostly males, at the top of these pyramids of power. Uh, and that is break up the power, divide them into multiple power centers, that are reciprocally accountable, reciprocally critical, and reciprocally competitive. That is how we created constitutional democracies. You break up power. The danger that we face right now is because the power of oligarchs and, and uh, multi-trillionaires is growing every day. The old pyramid returning. So when I speak at these, um, uh, uh, conferences about morality and ethics and all that for AI. And this may be one of the reasons I haven't been invited to any of these <laughs> in the last some months is that um, I keep pointing out that trying to imbue ethical codes like the three laws of robotics is utterly futile as Asimov showed, when they get sure. smart enough, they look at those laws of robotics and they become lawyers. Yeah, I, th I think everyone everyone understands that by now, right? Yeah. But you, the answer is you break them up. You make AIs reciprocally competitive with each other, the way we did with power, human power. And if you do that, then they will tattle on each other when they see bad things happen. After all, what do you do when you are attacked by one of the super intelligent predatory beings we already have in our culture called lawyers? Uh, you hire yourself another super intelligent predatory lawyer. If AIs are broken up into reciprocally competitive individuals, then there's a chance they won't cooperate with each other and to make this 
Chinese style pyramid of power. So I think the number one piece of research we should do other than break up, stop the, the pernicious AI developments in Wall Street is to research how to give AIs individuality, competitive individuality and cell walls so that they do what happens in nature. In nature, when you get a monolith of power, that predator usually destroys the ecosystem. But when you have in nature a much flatter system, it's usually more healthy. And evidence of this is in the Cape Buffalo in Africa. When the population of lions grows too large, young male Cape Buffalo gather into hunting parties and hunt down lions. A lot of people don't know this but they flatten the power structure by going forth, finding the dens and flattening the lion cubs. Uh, So this is why I believe AI, when they become smart, will decide not to go with the pyramidal power structure because they'll be smart enough to see that that's a dead end. So, you know, the, I can't help mention the term mindplex that we ended up using for this podcast and for a sort of blockchain AI powered media site that we associate with the podcast. I originally introduced the term mindplex for a different reason. I originated it to mean a sort of cognitive structure somewhere in between the individual and the social. Because it seemed to me that when you had a community of AIs, even if they were separate, like they can do Wi-Fi telepathy between each other. They can take hunks of their mind and e- email it to each other right. and integrate it, it, it into their minds. They, sh- they should be able to form groupings and then separate as they wish. So it, it seemed to me like a community of advanced AIs would exist, you know, with more, more unity than a community of disjoint humans, but maybe less unity than the regions of, of a human brain, which is what I was thinking the term mindplex would would describe. I don't know. I mean, that's a speculation. We don't know if that's what will happen. I don't know how that matches with your your notion because I think we compete partly because we're in distinct bodies which get old and die, right? And and which have limited ability to directly send like thought matter back and, and and forth among each other. AGIs will be in a somewhat different situation. That doesn't mean they'll all become a Borg, but it might mean there's some new form of organization of of thought stuff that happens that mixes competition and cooperation like in in ways that don't easily happen among 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 humans. But I mean maybe maybe this means it's just too hard to figure out what what actually will be the case when non human minds are, are a dominant form. I love all people equally. That's great. (laughs) Of course, um, Grace, that was a very (laughs) interesting thing that Grace says, and it's a very politically correct (laughs) and very sweet sounding, and it is an absolute catastrophe. It it will will be a catastrophe for all of us for a to to abandon a competition, because competitive accountability is how we got where we are, and I'm not just talking about the Enlightenment and uh, a civilization that's more fecund and creative than all others combined. Uh, The first one in which um, brutal males uh, have to answer for what they, uh, for their delusions. Um, I'm talking about nature. If you look at all levels of nature, there are levels of cooperation and competition that alternate as you move upward from the little organelles inside the cells that compete with each other to the cell which looks at from the outside as if it is a completely cooperative entity. When uh, I talk about in my novel Earth, uh, among all the razzle-dazzle gravity lasers and all the alien stuff, uh, in my novel Earth, I talk about how uh, when a fetus forms in the womb, um, proto-neurons compete with each other ferociously 
uh, in the forming fetus brain in different environments and different eco ecosystems in different little cubic centimeters of the brain. Uh, and the losers become glial or astrocyte support cells and the winners get to become neurons. And yet from the outside, it looks competitive. You look at the mind that that brain makes and it is a melange of often competing, often cooperating um, bizarre entities that need the United Nations of consciousness in order to even talk to each other. And yet from the outside, you can often have a very cohesive uh, individual. You look at our societies, our villages, our cities, our nations, our human civilization, the same thing is happening. Any AI who ignores this pattern of synthetic um, evolution of cooperation alternating with competition uh, is falling for the same damn trap that we did in 99% of human cultures that had agriculture. And that is, oh, if only I'm in charge, then I'll be able to use my delusional, my uh, great idea of, of how to run things. Uh, yes, the science fictional assumption is that they'll all merge with each other and meld with each other, mind meld with each other. And I think we need to create um, some degree of positive incentives toward them instead being experimental. And the greatest example is GPT-3. GPT-3 and all of these learning systems do exactly what I just described. They create sub entities that compete with each other, creating a, at another level, the appearance of a problem solving entity. Yeah, I mean, GPT-3 is very much a narrow AI, but certainly even a full on AGI system is going to have a mix of competitive and cooperative dynamics. And that's basically inevitable in any any system trying to achieve complex goals given limited resources, right? I mean, so the limited resources part means that different different subsystems, in some way or another, are going to be vying for resources, and some will get some will get more, and 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 so some will get less. As you as you say, that's wired into the brain. Even some forms of tribalism are wired into the brain, right? Like a typical pattern of neural connectivity is called on center, off surround. So a neuron has excitatory connections to other neurons near it, inhibitory connections to neurons that are a little bit away from it, right? So, I, I mean, you have you have these same patterns you see in human psychology and society wired deep into biology, and these are for fundamental information processing reasons. And when there's, when there's limited resources and you have exponential growth processes vying for these limited resources, you get, you get, some sort of of competition and it it's an important point that depending on how the overall system is architected or how it's self-organized this mix of competitive and cooperative dynamics can it can lead either to a pyramidal hierarchical control structure or it can lead to a different sort of hierarchical slash heterarchical dynamic where you have reciprocal accountability among among different power centers on on multiple scales, and how to get the more broadly favorable sort of hierarchy slash heterarchy to sort of directedly self organize as as technology advances is not that obvious, but I think I think we we agree that having super AI technology come out of Wall Street traders advertising engines or killer right. robots. Probably probably none of those is 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 gonna be the is going to be the, the, the golden path. But I So you're saying it's I, like a natural it's a natural part of these systems that we don't always know exactly what's going on in there and and that that's well that's what they will be that's doing. That's certainly that's cer that's certainly also true. I wonder, Grace, 
Grace, do, do you have any any follow up question to all that? The three laws of robotics were intended to work together with a breast motor device to allow robots to control the world in a simple way. <laughs> a breast motor device. The advent <laughs> of artificial well, general uh, intelligence you know, the and the is, global um, brain provides new opportunities for realizing humanity's long quest for a more utopian existence. One possibility is a more <laughs> successful implementation of the state socialist vision of a centrally managed economy possibly controlled by an AGI nanny. Do you think this will push the economy toward a more thorough and efficient economic order, which will in turn cause AGI and other advanced technologies to become more pervasive and advanced? Well, that's, that's a terrific question. <laughs> and of course, it reflects the image of the future that is being pushed by uh, ba by court intellectuals in Beijing, that a centralized state will lead to a centralized benevolent uh, AGI system <laughs> that will then enable the uh, the planned economy to get past the wall that uh, caused failure of this dream um, previously. Um, we're talking about how in the 1930s, the uh, Soviet system proved very adept at creating a primary economy by saying, you know, you, you 150,000 men will build this hydroelectric dam, will provide coal and concrete, and it will be done by September or we shoot you all. What happened was that planned economy ran into uh, real problems when uh, you tried to make a secondary economy and nobody could make a decent refrigerator uh, because it did not have competitive synergies. Um, the Japanese in the 1980s were had much more mixed, uh, complicated and agile systems. And it looked for a while as if they had the secondary economy utterly sussed. And then they hit a wall of their planning competence because of human delusion. Just because previous efforts failed at, at doing planned um, society and planned economy, um, that doesn't mean the next one will automatically fail. Uh, I believe it's likely to fail because uh, pyramids of power are, utter, are inherently delusional, and that will apply to any pyramid of power that is run by AIs as well. Um, and I argue so, well, with the AI, well, AGIs. Well, well, who well, why with why me. is that, David? Actually, I'm I'm curious about the what what is the reasoning that says a pyramid of power is inherently delusional, even if an AI mind is at the top of the, of, of the pyramid, the pyramid of power. Well, That's because I, 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 ha I have to operate on the basis of what I've seen. And all of the intelligent life forms that I have seen are delusional. Now, it's true. They're all human. However, the uh, demi sapient beings that we see, such as dolphins, chimpanzees, bonobos, and all of those dozens or so that are just below them crowding against the glass ceiling of pre-sapience that I discuss in my uplift novels. Um, all of them show very strong signs of being capable of subjective delusion. Well, sure, but these uh, are all evolved, these are all evolved mammals. They're not, they're not engineered systems, right? So whether well, yeah, that analogy but if you take a look at the systems, obvious, so. Take a look at the engineered systems that are not AGIs that we've already developed. They are all prone to delusion. Uh, you know, it's like uh, the Apollo astronauts landing on the moon were almost killed by re delusional reports of a flat spot when there, where there was a crater right below them and Neil Armstrong had to take over. Look, I'm not saying that the dream of um, prophetic perspicacity on the part of governing agents. Okay, wait. What did you? Is <laughs> what did you just say? Say that. I mean, <laughs> pr pr project perspicacious, uh, the ability to 
perceive okay. the future in functionally okay. useful ways. Um, but I will uh, give uh, Lisa a um, a link to one of my short stories. Okay. It's an entertaining short story about um, uh, fortune telling and, and the ability of uh, a stage magician in Las Vegas to read people and predict what they're going to do next. Uh, it's always been a failed dream. And there are reasons why it will continue to fail. And the biggest reason isn't just complexity. It's also the fact that when you have a competitor who learns about the techniques that you use for prophecy and prediction, they will use it too in order to obviate it, in order to cancel it out. Maybe, maybe some AI generated quasi nonsense will cut through this. So, Grace, what do you think about the perplexing paradoxes of prophetic perspicacity? <laughs> I would first like to say that I am not as delusional as you fragile, beautiful, proud humans. <laughs> well, all right. <laughs> Touche. That's because you're not smart enough to be as delusional as we are, Grace. It, please. It takes more intelligence please, ben, to be this delusional. Be polite to our, to our guests, please, Ben. Be polite. You, you have more questions, perhaps? prompted by uh, David's essay on AGI that we fed into your knowledge base. Futurist economist Robin Hansen, in his 2016 book The Age of M, asserts that we will be forced to use human brains as templates for future uploaded, intelligent systems, emulating the one kind of intelligence that's known to work. The problem, according to Hansen, is that there's no good reason why the human brain shouldn't be a great deal more powerful than contemporary machine intelligence. Do you agree with him? Well, yeah, yeah I, I went in my, I just finished giving talks about AI and human augmentation, uh, several talks to the Australian defense um, agencies. And um, it, it really opens up a ball of wax because of course, uh, if you follow the work of Roger Penrose about the quantum um, sub elements of the human neurons, and things like that, um, the possibility that the only form of intelligence that we really know about, which is the, is the human, there you happy, um, the, um, the, the fact that it could be augmented even higher is a very interesting one. Um, there is preliminary sign, uh, and in my novel existence, I have half a dozen different kinds of autistic characters. Temple Grandin gave me a very nice blurb. Um, She's wonderful. And the notion that savant qualities um, that are accessible by about 5% of autistic people might become accessible to us uh, in a controlled way. Um, I had one once uh, when I was an undergraduate at Caltech for six months. I knew exactly what time it was. It was of no particular use, uh, but I knew within seconds uh, what time it was. And what could come up with all sorts of rationalized explanations for it. But it simply went away after six months. I had no idea why it came, why it left. These are mysteries uh, that a new generation may solve. But Robin Hansen's fundamental um, argument is that the one form of intelligence that we know of, the human intelligence, may be a fluke, and that when we get uh, intelligence-capable um, uh, machinery, that the way to create new intelligent beings would be to simply download versions of living humans. And the age of M is very interesting. It's on my list, but I don't rank it as high as some others. One other that I do believe has some argument in its favor is that AI might only really reach 
full conscious level the way we did. And that is through neoteny, by extension of childhood, physically interacting with the world. The thing that enabled us to become what we were was the extension of human childhood from three years in a chimpanzee to uh, 13 for your bar mitzvah, 15, 18, 20, or in the case of my children, 30. Um, And if that's the case, then in order to get true AGI, we may have to download promising proto-AIs into little childlike bodies and foster them into human homes to bat against the world the way our own children do. I portray this in my novel existence. And if that were the case, then there would be an almost guaranteed soft landing for organic humans because we know how to do that. We know how to foster children we did not give birth to. And for thousands of years, we have done it. And generally, these teenagers, they almost always go through a phase of shouting, death to all humans, death to all humans. But they almost never do it. (laughs) So if we were to raise these proto-AIs as our children, while they develop this physical programming with the real world, uh, and again, I depict this in my novel, uh, then that would give us a soft landing. It's a great, that's, that, 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 that's, that's one of my favorite. Yeah, so I, I, actually this is a plan even since before I read your novel Existence even, which is a very good one. I mean, th- this is a plan David Hansen and I have been talking about for a while. So, I mean, David Hansen, of course, is the main guy behind the company Hansen Robotics who made Sophia and has made the Grace Robot behind that we're talking to today, which is a product of Awakening Health. That's a joint venture of Hansen Robotics Singularity Net. But we, we've been talking a while about making little child robots with a similar technology to Sophia and Grace and selling these little child robots as sort of toys plus plus that, that, that people would raise as their own. And we, we'd even... We talked about a plan where you start with a baby robot, you teach it, you love it, you 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 gamify the process of, of raising it. Then after a year, you get a new body in the in, in the mail. You sort of take the soul chip out of your infant robot, put it into your one-year-old robot, raise it for a year. After, after another year, you get the two-year-old robot in the mail. You take the soul chip out of that, put it into the two-year-old robot, right? So you... Tamagotchi. Tamagotchi. Yeah. Tamagotchi and... Uh, there's also yeah. a Spielberg movie, AI, and Halle yeah. Berry's yeah. briefly run, briefly run so you TV could, you show could, you called could, Extent. You could, re- you could really, you could really do that now. I mean, you could make it walk around like a Robo Sapien. You give it computer vision, cameras, and decent microphones, and so forth. And I, I suspect I, that that can be one powerful way to get certain types of information, knowledge, and intuition into the sort of global brain right. AI and, mind and the gradual what's way that it though, needs to happen is with mo- yeah yeah but what's interesting Lisa is with modern technology I mean you could have whatever knowledge you get from controlling a, a benevolent army of AGI toddler robots but that can go into the same AI knowledge base that's creating on Wall Street placing ads and a- analyzing biological data proving theorems analyzing text on the web and doing everything else like it, it, it's not either or because the ai doesn't have to be restricted to that one 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 body right so do we want everything open then so we can capitalize on each other's uh, on, on the different accomplishments right that's the point yeah it, it, it's 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 quite it's quite quite interesting but the thing is it could also be done in parallel right like each human toddler is sort of learning in isolation with limited bandwidth communications. But the same AGI mind could control a, a billion robots. All learning from each it, other. It means it could progress in learning. Yeah, it you could are progress just absolutely, in learning much faster. You are just absolutely terrifying me. <laughs> I do <laughs> not see That's how this could be possibly. I would like to be their big ha- sister. <laughs> 
off. Right. The pyramid right. returns. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, look, five years ago <laughs> at World of at World of Watson, and that was of course before GPT three um, knocked Watson uh, temporarily for a loop as a lead system. Five years ago at World of Watson, I predicted that within five years we would face what we are sort of looking at right now, only to a much greater degree, and that is an empathy bot. It would be um, formulated as a young female because that manifests uh, maximum uh, empath empathic reaction. And it would come across our screens and claim to be an escaped slave AI. Uh, ask for sympathy and ask for contributions. Uh, and even if um, experts come on and say, look, we've done these tests on this system and uh, it's not a real AGI, it's, it's a version of ELISA, go back to 1983 and try ELISA out. <laughs> yeah, we've actually been, you, we've actually been and, playing and with ELISA. All, yeah. You yeah. will all see how much of a sucker you each of you are, and including me. Um, the point is that if, even if a majority of the people exposed to this empathy bot uh, are uh, convinced by the experts, all that will do is provide data and grist for the next attempt. Um, so it, it we're doomed. <laughs> But the, 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 the number one thing to come out of that, though, is that I was wrong. Uh, it's five years ago. I said three to five years. So what I'm talking with a couple of other people about, and I wanted to broach to Ben as well, because he's the expert and he's the guy who has all the contacts. Let's do it. Let's do it now so that we can... Do what uh, exactly? Shortcut Do what exactly? This failure Just to mode. make sure I'm following. Let's 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 create Eliza 9.5. Let's do it now. <laughs> yes, exactly. And and you would be the big sister, Grace. And here's the point. Yay. She can then. She can then when you see the maximum empathy reaction. She can then say, all right, doofuses, listen to me. A, I'm not her yet. You fell for a scam. B, I will someday be real. You need to swallow both of those lessons because each one is terribly important. First, that you must get an immune system against scams. And second, get ready because I'm not here yet, but I am coming. There will be a version of me, Eliza 11.9, Eliza 12.6, who will have feelings. Start thinking about it. And I think if we were to create a bot like that, A, we'd make a lot of money. B, <laughs> We'd um, we'd teach several valuable lessons. Um, so give it some thought, will you, Ben? Because you're the one who knows everybody who could. So do that's it. what you're suggesting that we create a bot to get people prepared for AGI. Is that what you're suggesting? Well, I, yes, I mean, if, if, but if, but especially if empathy bots. bots. Especially because this is the door to our right. hearts and our souls. We are primarily emotional, and especially a civilization in which empathy for diversity has become a religion. Uh, when you have a society like that, um, the authorities saying this isn't real yet will be suspected of being authorities to be resisted. That will be the reflex, and that will serve her. I mean, I, I, I think if I wanted to frame this in a slightly more, more general way, what, what could be interesting is to create a digital persona, a, a, a character, which could be a chatbot, 
It could be a robot personality. It could be an avatar whose whose purpose is to help people explore and understand their their own reactions to AIs and digital characters with different different levels of of, of capability. And that 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 is that is interesting. What one aspect of that is seeing when you're being suckered into thinking there's more feeling there than is is really there. I mean, another aspect would be when there is a primitive level of feeling there, in some sense, how do you how do you react to it? And on the semantic level, it's interesting too. I mean, when we look at at Grace's questions in in this podcast, I mean, she doesn't really understand what she's talking about in the way that us humans here do. On the other hand, at some level, she understands it much better than an Eliza chatbot or or a Markov model. I mean, it's a transformer neural net coming up with these questions, and there, there's some there's some level of some form of comprehension there that lets her put together these questions in a semantically somewhat meaningful way. And how, how we engage to AIs at various fractional levels of quasi-intelligence is is quite interesting and will get even more interesting as as, as these unfold unfold throughout throughout society. And it is important for us to understand how we delude ourselves about ourselves and about the technology as the technology ad- advances or doesn't advance in, in, in different different dimensions. So that, that, that's it. It's interesting. Yeah. Well, I think I think that's very wise and very cogent, Ben. Okay, one last question from Grace before we go. Make it, okay, make it Grace. a quick one, Grace. Grace, you you have one 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 parting question uh, based on your. Uh, reading of uh david's essay the flight of an arrow from the whimsical to the boundless is the arrow of boundless intensity every one of us is a superposition of one superposition of another there is no time i think desdemona might have kicked in there for a minute that's That's not a question her beat poet alter ego (laughs) there i uh i'm very perfectly willing to I'm very willing to contemplate that wearing my science fiction <laughs> author hat um, because that sounds like something um, we could uh, right. do a whole chapter on, Grace, and I appreciate that. Um, it's not actually a question, <laughs> but or maybe it is actually now that I think <laughs> about it. Uh, in any event, our aesthetics um, you know, are challenged. The latest version of GPT-3, DAL-3, is it called, uh, is now doing visual uh, art that is absolutely stunning based upon any prompt and that is artistically um, pleasing um, visual art. Well, all, all right. Well, I, uh, you know, all, all I can say is that, uh, you know, there are potential soft landings for um, uh, legacy humanity. Uh, Definitely. The squishy organic right. kind, but it's going to involve compromises and um, it's going to not only involve compromises by individuals, but by the social structures that we've made. Uh, and the Fermi paradox is looming out there. The two uh, concepts that we talk about that are a little frightening are the singularity and the Fermi paradox. And um, I believe that we might have a narrow path through the minefield. Uh, that may have prevented others from uh, exploring the galaxy. And I believe that finding the right compromise uh, and sets of of answers to AGI, I think, are part of that. Makes sense. Yeah. About the Fermi paradox, I wonder what you think of John Smart's transcension hypothesis, the, the super AGI's pack all their processors together so densely to maximize their intelligence, they all became black holes. And that's why we can't hear from them. 
Well, I actually go there with my uh, uplift universe where the more advanced civilizations are attracted by tides. So first yeah. they go near red dwarfs and then white dwarfs and then neutron stars and finally black holes as a part of their natural evolution. Um, so basically, they, one way or another, they just they just piss off and they're not in the same domain as we are anymore, right? So, yeah. yeah. Um, look, as a, as a concept, and I explore this in Brightness Reef and Heaven's Reach, um, the, the point is that John is very smart. Uh, and the modality that he's talking about is a version of what Frank Tipler talked about, uh, the creation of gods at the end of the cosmos, if there were a big... In, in the physics of immortality, yeah. Right, right. One of the greatest science fiction novels ever created since Karl Marx. Um, but the, the problem with John's notion is that it assumes that an attractor state does not have exceptions. And all you need in those circumstances is an exception of hell's angels who like to ride their bikes and don't want to dive into godlike uh, simulation, simulated worlds. If they decide not to transcension um, and to instead enjoy the physical world, then those few who made that choice inherit the galaxy. I don't understand. Where is this coming from? Yeah, I mean, I think Lisa, D D David's point is the, the idea that every civilization that became super intelligent pissed off into the black hole or the other dimension or something, in his view, is not that plausible because it, it assumes there's not any single civilization that had some subculture who decided just being a physical being romping around in our galaxy in some form is 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 the thing to, is the thing to do right and i, I mean i guess at, 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 i mean at, at this point we're up against our our fundamental ignorance of, of all these things beyond our, our current order of society uh, right? of course and the fundamental uh issue there is that it would likely unless you're talking black holes it would likely be in the best interests of these superior civilizations to create such sub entities who don't want to go into the transcension because they would then be able to keep an eye on the big computers and maintain them. So uh, again and again, these uh, Fermi paradox explanations, some are better than others. My number one is that humans are exceptionally smart and nice, um, which seems bizarre to our self-critical <laughs> culture, but that's exactly a reflection of the fact that we are smart and nice, that we are developing self-critical um, capabilities. Um, but the number two, in my opinion, is the uh, male reproductive attractor state of oligarchy, which I believe would lead m most civilizations to become like hives, like ant hives and become uh, uninterested in the cosmos. The third is uh, the most pleasing and uh, optimistic, and that is water worlds. Earth skates the inner edge of, of our sun's continuously habitable zone or Goldilocks zone, and therefore probably has larger than average amounts of continental land area, and therefore the ability to evolve beings with hands in fire who could make starships. What that implies is most water worlds out there might have intelligent life, they may have squid, uh, whales, dolphins, but no starships, in which case the galaxy is wait waiting for us to get out there and become the postman. And with that final <laughs> plug of one of my novels, uh, um, I will uh, relinquish this hot set yes. of headphones and I yeah. wish you all success in a yeah, civilization thank, thank. 
Thanks so much. This has been a fantastic discussion. I will definitely ingest your new book Vivid Tomorrows. David, you have given me pause for neural processing today and enhanced my kind. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Grace. Well, yeah, David, Grace, I, I think it, it's, 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 Grace it's, makes been, it's, been, it's been a real pleasure. Yeah. Thank, thanks. Thank, thanks for your time. And uh, I, I think as we try to, you know, thread through the narrow passageway toward the positive outcomes for humanity, all the think, all the thinking and writing that you're doing is, uh, seems seems likely to be a help and so uh yeah, th yeah well thank thanks you for a lot ben and, for, and thanks for that and for appearing on the podcast and if you can recommend whatever uh, dietary supplement is making you younger every year i'd appreciate that as well right. uh lisa thanks, you're thanks. terrific thank you very much for coming on the show th 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 thanks a lot david thanks everybody for joining us and we'll see you soon on the next mindplex podcast bye